Ed kör tam 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 tam. So you might remember a video I made, the 10 most wholesome animals in nature. And even though I admitted literally in the title that it was biased, I missed one. And I have no other excuse than I just forgot. So we're all familiar with the oppression Oreo of the ocean, they need no introduction. And you'll remember that I've called them the ultimate apex predator, with apex standing for ain't no person pressing them no exceptions. Well, there is one exception. There is at least one animal that'll stand up to this barcoded sea assault. That's right, we're talking about humpback whales, aka your new favorite whale because humpbacks will often go out of their way to interfere with orca hunts, basically calorie blocking them. And this 40 ton equalizer will often rescue seals, sunfish, and even other species of whales from attacking orcas. And it's not like humpbacks are immune to orca fates, in fact that's probably how this all started. You see, orcas hunt like the wolves of the sea, by cutting off the young or weak from the group and then battering them into exhaustion. This strategy means this overgrown yin yang guppy is directly responsible for taking humpback calves off the census. So humpbacks do this thing called mobbing where they'll confront and square up with killer whales to defend their next generation. And it's at a point where humpbacks will hear the sound of an orca hunt and take it personally, which is pretty bold for an animal with no teeth. But they do have flippers that can grow to the length of a pickup truck, with barnacles growing on them which basically gives them barnacle brass knuckles. They use that and their size to send killer whales packing to protect their young. Now, lots of animals be out here mobbing, and it's not exactly crazy to see an animal defending one of its own. Except, they don't just do this with their own. In 2009, a pair of humpback whales rescued a crab eater seal from a pack of orcas that was about to make it into a memory, which they did by harassing the orcas until they eventually gave up. A week later, a humpback bailed out a weddle seal by rolling onto its back and placing the seal on its belly after the ops of the ocean had knocked it into the water. And in 2012, a pair of humpback whales attempted to rescue a gray whale calf that had been separated from his mother by a pod of sea pandas. And even after the baby whale was reverse born, the two humpbacks proceeded to harass the orcas for the next six hours. Think about that. They could have been doing anything else with their time and they actively chose to help out a different species. Now you can argue it's instinctual. Adult humpbacks will often escort a mom and calf pair since they're the most vulnerable to orca attacks. And it's possible that whales naturally defend any calves being attacked by orcas. If there are no calves around, they just defend the next best thing, which I guess in some cases might be a seal. But that leaves one big question, why? Whales aren't exactly stupid, they know the difference between a seal and their own kind. So why go out of their way and actively put themselves in danger for something they're not even related to? Maybe they're just chill like that, and also you don't have to be a seal to be temporarily adopted by a whale. Marine biologist Nod Hosser was terrified when a humpback spent 10 minutes pushing and nudging her. She was terrified until she noticed a 15 foot tiger shark looming on the other side of the whale. Cetaceans are arguably the smartest things on the planet without thumbs, so it's possible they're smart enough to have compassion. Or they could literally be the orca's biggest hater that refuses to let any sea pandas eat while they're around. Altruistic animal or generational hater, either way the entire ocean should be grateful for the gatekeepers of the sea. They're not the only whales here either. Cause if Thanos snapped beluga whales into oblivion, the world would be a much darker place. And I'm not just saying that cause they're white. Everything about the beluga whale is free serotonin. These travel sized whales are often called the canaries of the sea since they communicate with a series of high pitched calls. And it sounds nothing like anything that should come from a whale. Now I know some person's gonna say I shouldn't call an animal cute because I'm assigning human traits to an animal. F that, it's f***ing adorable. And so is the fact that belugas often imitate the sound of human voices. There was even a time where navy divers were working underwater on a whale enclosure. The supervisor would communicate with the divers through an underwater device called a wet phone. Well, one of the divers climbed out and was confused because when he asked who told him to come up, everyone said they hadn't said anything to him. Well, turns out, one of the beluga whales named Nosi did. When the supervisor wanted one of the divers to surface, he would just say out. Nosi heard this, memorized it, and mimicked it so well that the diver swore it came from a human until Nosi did it again. And he somehow managed to repeat it several octaves lower than what belugas usually use to communicate. Yeah, they're that smart. Parrots and ravens can be trained to mimic human speech, but Nosi did it spontaneously and just for the memes. And it's not just a fluke, beluga brains are twice the size of a human's with more folds in the area responsible for problem solving. It's how a beluga whale can be smart enough to play fetch with your phone. They're also natural extroverts that can travel in groups of tens, twenties, and sometimes hundreds. And of course there was that time a beluga whale fell in love with a human. But like, in, in a cute way, not whatever this was. Tina was a beluga whale in a South Korean zoo, but when she was first brought in, she had a lot of trouble getting settled in. One of the male zookeepers spent a lot of time with her and went out of his way to pay extra special attention to her. Again, not like this. The result? 
Tina caught feelings. She would only kiss him. She'd spit water at anyone that she thought got too close to him. And when other keepers tried to get the same love, she would reject them. So basically, Tina became a jealous, clingy girlfriend. And yet, we're still talking about a whale here. Basically, who this guy thought he was, this guy actually is. But yeah, belugas are way smarter and way more wholesome than they get credit for. Despite having one of the most demonic looking mugshots you'll ever see. Just like orangutans who are probably the best single mothers you'll find in nature. Orangutans spend their entire lives in the trees. It's actually how they got their name, which translates to man of the forest. This means orangs are hundreds of feet above the possibility of being clapped by a tiger. But it also means that mothers have to eat, sleep, and travel while the next generation literally clings onto them. Every night, Mama Orang will build a bed for her and her baby from scratch using the branches around her. And again, she has to do this while praying gravity doesn't straight up snatch her child. And that's pretty much her life for the foreseeable future. Because orangutans are the biggest mama's boys on a planet that aren't human. They typically spend six to nine years as their mother's shadow, but can easily stay well past a decade. Because being a ginger tree gorilla has a high learning curve, O-Rang spend all this time learning how to orangutan from their mothers. But sometimes they choose to just not leave at all. And with the cost of rent, who could blame them? And while the sons usually dip out far and wide to start their own lives, the daughters usually stick around close to where their mothers raise them. They'll even visit their mothers every so often and even help out with any younger siblings. But honestly, the most wholesome thing about them is that this man is still able to walk. Because if Diet Bigfoot would have folded him like a lawn chair, I don't think anyone would have blamed her. Honestly, with orangutans in general, if they really wanted to rock our world, they could probably do damage. Like, you remember the orangutan that figured out how to pick locks and escape his enclosure and use this knowledge to flex on his zookeepers? If Fu Manchu had a malicious bone in his body, he probably would have caught a body. So we should all be thankful that orangutans are like the underachieving genius of the great ape group. Because if Planet of the Apes ever becomes non-fiction, I'm going to be way more worried about what Maurice might try to pull than whatever power trip Caesar might be on. Orangs would be the ones to discover 4chan and dox anyone they think might be a threat. And if we ever get to that point, going off the grid with a service like NordVPN might be your only option. Because NordVPN creates an encrypted tunnel for your data and protects your identity by hiding your IP address. Meaning you can disappear to a place no tech-savvy simian can find you. Speaking of disappear, orangutans are endangered mostly due to habitat loss and poaching. But it's also possible that they've been using NordVPN to connect to one of thousands of different servers across countries all over the world and that they've been hiding their location as they plot... something. Because even though they're typically found in Borneo and Sumatra, with NordVPN, a server 3,000 miles from them would be only a click away. And I do mean click, because with Nord, you don't ever have to feel like you sold your speed for security. Additionally, with NordVPN's threat protection, you can enjoy the internet or plot the downfall of the human race without also having to worry about ads, trackers, and malware. So to get the most out of your streaming service, go to nordvpn.com slash casualgeographic to cop a huge discount on a two-year plan with an additional four months free. And with NordVPN's money-back guarantee, it's basically risk-free. Being around the next animal is also risk-free, unless you happen to be allergic to happiness. Because let me tell you, depression here is the Undertaker's theme when this ginger beef pulls up. Honestly, I didn't know a lot about Highland cows before this. They're here almost entirely because of their looks. They're the oldest registered breed of cattle in the world, and they originated from Scotland. But with their ketchup smear haircut, you probably already knew that. If you had the chance to change your fit, would ya? Looking in the face, cow. But let's talk about that hair. That shaggy fur coat means they can eat all the freezing weather the Scottish Highlands have to offer, especially rain and snow. And having buffalo bangs is believed to protect their eyes from pestering flies, while also making them look like the fifth beetle. Even though I literally just said ginger, they come in a lot of flavors, including white, black, silver, red, dun, etc. But the real reason they're here? They're basically the capybara of cattle. And like the capybara, they have no business being this unproblematic. They used to have to deal with dangers like bears, wolves, coyotes, and even mountain lions. And you'd think that they'd use that generational trauma to justify road raging at anything with a pulse. But the most dangerous thing about them is that if you get their attention too quickly, they might just accidentally clothesline you. But even that's more on you than him. A clear-cut social hierarchy means Highlands rarely have to deal with fights within the group. Meaning any violence they cause is strictly an accident. And since their insulating fur helps keep them warm, even in some of the most unforgiving weather, they don't have to compensate by packing extra fat. Since that means they don't completely crush the plants under them, and since they're considered light grazers that only eat the tops of grass instead of cutting it all the way down, that means this cow manages to even be a friend to grass. It's pretty much a tank with Golden Retriever software running it. And we should be thankful for them just existing. This last animal is going to sound random, but once I give you his full backstory, it'll make sense. So let's talk about Pale Mail. Nah, not the guy from the movie High School really had no business showing. Pale Mail was a red-tailed hawk that moved to New York City in the early 90s. At first, he tried nesting in a tree, but then got evicted by a neighboring family of crows who I guess wasn't accepting of his kind. And I'm guessing one of their names was Jim. So he decided to settle on a building on 5th Avenue just across from Central Park. And once he was all good and settled, he found a mate who people named First Love. 
they 100% jinxed her because she would become injured and was moved to a Raptor rehab center in New Jersey. And evidently, PM would rather start all over than move to New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey. I can make those jokes. But while she was gone, he found a new mate. This one, a young female named Chocolate. You can just call that an entanglement. The first time parents struggled to bring up their kids, but eventually would successfully raise three chicks who would go on to live in a nearby park. And a little while after that, a car would turn pale male into a widow after Chocolate collided with it on a New Jersey turnpike. But one could argue that was her fault for being in New Jersey in the first place. But just like that, First Love returned fresh from rehab and lived up to her name after she and Pale Mel reunited. And together, First Love and Pale Mel raised multiple chicks. That is until First Love became initials on Pale Mel's Twitter bio after she ate a poisoned pigeon. And at this point, Pale Mel became a playboy who went through multiple partnerships and chicks. We have no way of knowing for sure, but it's believed Pale Mel had at least 4 wives and up to 25 children. Also at one point, building workers removed his longtime nest, so for a while it looked like it was up for him. But by this time, Pale Mel had fans, and they weren't having any of it. And after multiple protests, the city compromised by installing a cradle for Pale Mel and whoever he was shacking up with to nest in. So yeah, bro had all types of plot armor. We don't know if he's still alive, but if he is, that would make him well over 30. But we do know his DNA is still flying around Central Park to this day. And as a bird of prey who hunts them for a living, that makes Pale Mel directly responsible for single-handedly nerfing the number of rats and pigeons in this city. And if you're not thankful for that, then you've never been in New York. And as someone who used to be afraid of pigeons, I know that's something I'm thankful for. But that's gonna do it for this video. Be sure to check out my TikTok and Instagram, and also consider becoming a patron on Patreon if you want to further support this channel. But yeah, make sure you drink water, hug all your relatives while you still can, and don't wait till Thanksgiving to be thankful. And I'll see y'all in the next one.